question on covenant ophthalmology. Thank you. So I left us yesterday in a sort of awkward spot where I'd given you uh, this big and complicated definition of this tensor category that I'd called C star. And I'd said that, uh, that we'd crept up on the definition of covenant ophthalmology. The idea is just that the invariant of some link is, well, you think of that link as giving you an element of some home space in this category C star. Uh, and it's just home from 0 points to 0 points. This is just sort of thinking that a link is a special case of a tangle with no points at the top and bottom. But let's just make this much more explicit right at the beginning now, uh, just for the sake of everyone having a, uh, a, a clear recipe for putting this together. And I'll, I'll do an example at the same time. OK, so here's the, the rule. Uh, let's make a big cube. People who've seen Kravano homology before, uh, before yesterday will, uh, will be familiar with this starting point. The vertices are just, uh, um, well, I'll say complete resolutions. of L, so that is you take each crossing and you turn it either into the, 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 what, the, zero, uh, the zero resolution or the one resolution. So the vertices of this cube are just uh, uh, systems of closed circles. And I guess I'll tell you here a grading and a homological height to attach to each vertex with a factor of q to, well, I'll, I'll get this number right just so you have the recipe, but it's a, it's a little bit ridiculous. Uh, so with the coefficient of q to the, let's see, so it's the number, I'll write, write this. This means the number of positive crossings for which we've used the zero resolution, OK? Uh, plus twice the number of positive crossings for which we've used the one resolution, uh, minus the number of negative crossings for which we've used the zero resolution minus two times the number of negative crossings for which we've used the one resolution. OK, so now each vertex of the cube is a complete resolution of the link and some factor of q sitting out the front. And homological height uh, the number of positive crossings which we've given the one resolution minus the number of negative crossings which we've given the one resolution. OK. And now let me tell you the edges of this cube. So the edges are just saddle cobordisms, uh, changing a single crossing. And these are directed edges. So uh, they go from the zero resolution to the one resolution for positive crossings of the knot, and from one resolutions to zero resolutions for negative crossings of the knot. And if you stop and check, uh, this rule about which direction the edges point is consistent with this height function that I've put on the vertices of the cube. The edges always connect a, a vertex at one height with a vertex at the height one greater. And uh, let's um, attack on the, well, put, put with the saddle cobordisms a sign uh, minus one to the number of one resolutions for later crossings. So let me explain later. Uh, for, for this, rule for the science to make sense, uh, I have to get you to pick an ordering on all of the crossings appearing in the diagram of the knot. Uh, and if you pick different orderings, you'll build slightly different cubes with signs in different places, but the answer won't matter in the end. Uh, OK. And the point is that uh, 
this uh, is a chain complex. In this crazy category, home C without the star, uh, zero to zero. I mean, the point is that complexes in home C without the star are elements of home C with a star. That was the theater idea yesterday. Okay, and so this more explicit version is the, the definition that you see, for example, in, uh, I'll just write up the, the archive reference in case people would like to see that, this explicit version written out in more detail. And that'll help you unravel all of the nonsense that I said yesterday uh, about graded tensor categories. Okay, so let me do an example as well. Um, just just uh, illustrating this. Okay, so the Kovanov homology of, uh, oops, that's not the nut I wanted to draw. Of the Hopf link, which I'll draw, uh, I'll draw like this. Well, it's got two crossings in here, so it's just going to be a two-dimensional cube. And if you follow all of the rules in the recipe here, you get this gadget. There's no need to copy down this diagram if you picked up a copy of the notes yesterday or replace the two in this URL with a one. You'll get exactly the copy of the diagram that I'm, that I'm copying at the moment. Oh, sorry, I need to add a Q to the four there. And, oh, what else do I need to put? I'll draw an underline here. Remember the underline was notation I had yesterday telling you that this is the object in homological height zero so this is height zero, this is height one, this is height two. These arrows which I haven't labeled yet are the differentials. And I'll just draw the, uh, the differentials like this. It's just a notation to tell you where to do a saddle cobordism. So here you get from this diagram to this diagram by doing a little saddle in this region here. Okay, so that's all very well. But the invariant that we have at the moment for a knot is a pretty awful thing. Who wants some complex in some pretty abstract category as the invariant of a knot? What we want now is a, is a standard form for elements of this home space where the invariants of links live. So just like uh, for Templi Lieb, uh, we had that home in Templi Lieb from zero points to zero points was actually just isomorphic to Laurent polynomials in Q. We want, uh, we want something like that. And the, the theorem here, I think I'm intending to prove the theorem right now. Yep, okay. So the theorem right now is that crazy complexes in this category, well, this home space, remember that's just a category, is isomorphic to the category of bigraded vector spaces. And I'm gonna describe this isomorphism two times. The first time I'll describe it in a way that feels familiar if you already like Kravana homology. And in particular, it's the one and only time in, in these two lectures that I'll use the word homology not as part of the phrase Kovanov homology. And then the second time I'll describe the isomorphism slightly differently and actually convince you that, that this is an isomorphism and all these complexes really are, well, yeah, that we really get this. Okay, so first, let's try this. So we have a functor. Uh, let's see. Um, let me say first of all, this one. Uh, yeah. No, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, remember that you can take any link and stick it into this home space 
as a, uh, as a complex. But I'm certainly not saying that that's subjective. So the, the, really, there's two compositions here. Yeah. I'm mean, sorry, two, two maps. You can take links and put them in here and then turn anything in here into a back-graded vector space. But yeah, I wasn't saying that. OK, so what's this functor? Well, if uh, I'll tell you where it's to and from. That'll make it much easier. So if I have an element of this, this category, of this home space, this is C without a star. So th this element, the home space here is just consists of template leap diagrams, maybe with factors of Q, maybe with direct sums. No complexes here. Two vector spaces. What's this, what's this functor? Well, it just looks at all of the surfaces, modular all the relations that we described yesterday, from the empty diagram to whatever diagram you're thinking about. Okay? And let's, first of all, beef this functor up a little bit and take the direct sum over all integers, I guess S is safe. We'll take the home from Q to the S times the empty diagram. And now this is a functor to graded vector spaces. And the grading is just given by that direct sum. The reason why we, uh, we want to do this is remember, in this home space, the home space that describes the surfaces we care about from one diagram to another, there's this condition on the Euler characteristic. And taking this direct sum just allows all, Euler, or just allows all Euler characteristics. OK. So we've got that guy. Well, we can apply this functor to a complex here. So remember, the elements of this home space here are complexes in this category. So each chain group is an object in this category. Each differential in a complex here is a morphism in this category. So we can just apply this functor sort of term by term along the, along the chain complex. So given a complex x, in the, the homotopy category, we can apply this functor get a complex of graded vector spaces. and then take homology. OK. And that gives us a, um, that gives us a bigraded vector space. There's the internal grading that came from looking at the different Euler characteristics of surfaces here. And then there's the homological grading after we took homology. OK, so that certainly took us from here to here. But the worry, uh, I guess I want to use this board, the worry is that we might have lost a whole lot of information, uh, in particular when we took homology, who knows what we're throwing out, uh, of the homotopy type of that complex that we started with. And so the, the second version of thinking about the map in this theorem is just going to be, well, you don't need to worry about that. Actually, in some sense, all of these complexes are homotopy equivalent to their homology. So let's think about that. So what are the objects in just HOM C, not HOM C star? Well, these are just temporary leave diagrams, uh, but with no boundary points. So they're just some collection of circles. And we know that a circle is isomorphic to direct sums of copies of the empty diagram. So objects in here are all isomorphic uh, to Direct sums of, well, q to the s times the empty diagram for different values of s with whatever multiplicities you like. OK. So every complex in HOM C star 0 to 0 has a representative where all of the chain groups are of this form. So let me just uh, schematically indicate 
something there. Um, well, um, yeah, let me actually do it in this example. OK. Uh, let's just use the isomorphism to remove all of the circles in this diagram. That complex up there is isomorphic to uh, one that looks like this. Each circle, remember, turns into a Q times the empty diagram, direct sum Q inverse times the empty diagram. So I'm just taking Q squared times Q plus Q inverse squared. OK. And over here, we'll get uh, Here we'll get, uh, oh, did I? Sorry, yeah, there are two copies of this guy, yeah. I'll write two instead of writing direct sums. Uh, okay, so what are the differentials now here? Well, this differential here has to be some little matrix whose matrix entries are maps from one direct sum end to another, so it's a little four by four matrix. But what are the matrix entries? Well, um, this is in the, the filled in circle direction, the surface direction. Home um, from the empty diagram to the empty diagram. Um, and even if we put factors of Q in, so let's look at Q to the S times the empty diagram, Q to the R times the empty diagram. Well, this is just C generated by <laughs> the empty surface. <laughs> if s equals r and 0 otherwise. There are no possible surfaces with Euler characteristic 0. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, what did I want to say? Well, all of, the, all of the surfaces, the closed surfaces, that don't have Euler characteristic 0 are equal to 0 because of our relations. For example, you might think that this guy here should be um, a, a cobordism from the empty diagram to the empty diagram, and it would be uh, the this would look like it's a valid map from Q to the S times the empty diagram to Q to the S plus two times the empty diagram. If you go look up the rule about Euler characteristics, but this is equal to zero. Uh, I guess a good exercise to see this follows from the relations that we talked about earlier, and you can check in fact that everything. Uh, it, it, everything that doesn't have Euler characteristic zero is actually equal to zero. And everything that has Euler characteristic equal to zero, that is dissonant unions of tori, are actually just multiples of the empty diagram. So that's the only home. So what's that saying? Well, just all of these matrix entries here are, uh, are either zero or a complex multiple of the empty cobordism. OK. So what's the point of that? Well, every matrix entry in the complex Move over here. Every matrix en entry in the complex is either zero or invertible. Uh, I and this is the first point, I guess, where it matters that I wanted to work over C or at least a field. It occurs to me that I, I should um, say a little bit more about why this was true. So let me, let me go back to that example that I, that I had before. So let me just recall some of the relations. The, the important one that we're going to use is that any time you see a tube in one of these surfaces, this is just equal to a sum, a linear combination of two surfaces. We place the tube with two disks and put a, a dot on one of the two disks. So an immediate consequence of this is that if you have uh, a little bit of genus anywhere, this is just equal to two times that sheet with a dot on it instead of the genus. You just apply this neck-cutting relation across here and see that both of these terms collapse because the dots can both move to the sheet. OK, in particular, that, for example, means that if you have a, a torus, 
that's equal to 2 times a sphere with a dot on it, which was equal to 2, because one of our relations was that a sphere with a dot on it was equal to 1. And let me uh, just do a, another sort of example calculation that lets you check this. I said a moment ago that because of the relations, this guy has to be equal to 0. Well, why is that? Well, okay, let, let's just use this backwards. This is now equal to a quarter times a sphere with two dots on it. But uh, that was, uh, we, said a, we said anything with two dots on it was equal to zero. And similar arguments, you can, you can quickly generalize this and, and see that it, whatever the Euler characteristic was, you, you got that result. Okay, so every, every matrix entry in the differential of one of these complexes is either zero or invertible. And then the, the very easy observation is that uh, every complex of this form is homotopic to one with all differentials zero. Uh, so I'm, I know I'm sort of, it, you, you might feel that I'm belaboring this point uh, and you, you sort of, you know that uh, complexes of vector spaces are homotopic to their homology, so what's the big deal? The, the, the reason I'm belaboring this point is that the proof of this statement uh, in this context uh, is sort of the, the essential step of all of the computer programs that compute Kovanov homology fast. And so it's worth understanding the particular way in which I'm going to prove this if you ever want to know how the programs work. Okay, so let me just uh, show you this. Say I have... Uh, some complex of the following form. Where, oh sorry, these are direct sums. Yeah. Where some matrix entry of some differential is invertible. All right, G for invertible. Let me label uh, some of these other maps. Uh, any complex of this form where there's something invertible is homotopic to the following slightly smaller complex. Uh, and here we just put beta minus. What can we do? We can follow lambda, then C inverse, then mu. Yeah. That must be it. Okay. It's actually kind of fun to, to think if you, if you have a complex that's describing uh, um, Handles glued on in a in a uh, in, in cellular homology for space. What what this homotopy is doing? What that term is? Um, that's a, that's another exercise. Okay, uh, so there we go. Uh, we just iteratively apply this. Anytime we see some matrix entry of a differential which isn't zero, well then it's invertible, and so we chuck it away and remove contractible sum ends. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, zero. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the point is, anytime you see a matrix entry that isn't zero, you throw it out using this little trick. And, and this, this trick is really just a matter of um, sort of <coughs> diagonalizing something here so that this uh, E mapping to F by C is, is actually a, a sum and that you can, that you can homotop away. So the, the proof of this is, is easy. It, it really is just seeing that you can write this as a sum and, and then, and then seeing that it's contractible. Okay. So, the, I think the right thing, the, oh, oh, so, okay, so I'll show you an example of, of this in action, but what's the point? Well, now we know, of course, that we didn't lose any information in this first version of the functor where we turned things into vector spaces and then took homology. Because in this version, we take our complex, we find a homotopy representative of it with no differentials. Then we can apply that functor that turns it into vector spaces. But there are no differentials, so the homology step is trivial. We, we lost no information in taking, uh, taking homology. Okay, so now let me show you uh, an example to see how in practice you, uh, you efficiently com compute, homolo compute Kovanov homology using, uh, using that. Hopefully, my attempt to use technology will work. Oops. 
¿no? to stand here. <laughs> oh, okay. So here's just a little example of how to efficiently calculate the Kovana from all of you of the trefoil knot by working locally. So we started with the, in the first line with just the definition of the invariant of, the, of a single crossing in this setup. And then on the second line, we stick two crossings together. And the rule for producing this complex here is to just take the tensor product of two copies of this complex, uh, combining the, the objects and differentials by stacking the corresponding bits on top of each other. Uh, you should have a think about that if, uh, if you need to have a think about that. In the next step, we look at this object in the complex right here and see that it has a circle in it and use this isomorphism that a circle is a direct sum of copies of the, of the empty object to write the complex like this. A fantastic exercise is to look at these four differentials in here and work out how we got them. All that they are are the compositions of these differentials here with components of the isomorphism that remove the circle. Okay, you can work those out. And now we notice there's something that's, uh, that's invertible here. Notice that we're, we're working here in a, in a much broader context than, than the one I was talking about just a moment ago. We could apply this lemma just a moment ago because, uh, well, we could apply this, this homotopy because any matrix entry of the differential which wasn't zero was invertible right away. Okay, here that's not true, of course. Um, this, this arrow here, sorry, uh, this is notation that I should have explained. This is just meant to mean two vertical sheets over those, those two arcs, and one of those sheets has a dot on it. That's the, uh, the two lines with a dot. It means that take the identity cobordism, but put a dot on one sheet. That's some cobordism in this category. It's neither zero nor invertible. So we can't apply the lemma on, on that arrow. Uh, but we look around and we, and we see that we can apply the, the lemma on that arrow. That's the identity morphism. So we cancel that off and we end up with this complex. Uh, so this differential here, where we take this differential here and subtract from it the composition going around, oops, going around the, the three morphisms the other way. We get to here. Okay. So that's a simpler homotopy representative of the invariant for this little tangle. And then we close off the tangle on the right by connecting up the two rightmost points with the strand. Uh, maybe I should have uh, done it. Does this work? Yeah, that works. Okay. So now some nice things happen. Looking, uh, let, let, let's explain why this differential here is suddenly zero. Well, before the differential was the, the, the difference of two different cobordisms with dots in different places. But when we connect up these strands on the right here, those two dots are now in the same place. They're both just on that vertical sheet. And so the difference cancels and we get zero. Okay, so we have this little complex. We take this circle and expand that using the isomorphism. Notice that there's an identity uh, entry in the differential here. Cancel that off using the lemma from over here again and end up here. And then finally we can uh, um, close off the tangle a little bit more and get the invariant of the Hopf link which is just this complex with no differentials. It's already in that form that, that we knew this lemma would let us get to. I guess I hadn't said this before, but um, the people often talk about the two variable Kovanov polynomial of a link. And that's just the polynomial that records uh, where these sum ends are, their Q degrees and their homological heights. So there's a T to the zero times one plus Q squared, which keeps track of these two guys in homological height zero and a t squared times q to the 4 plus q to the 6, which keeps track of these two guys in homological height 2. Okay, so there are three little exercises that you could enjoy doing. Uh, verify at t equals 1, that's, that polynomial is the Jones polynomial. Go back and understand all the steps in this calculation. It's in the lecture notes from yesterday. And then go one step further and compute the Kovanov homology of the trefoil. And of course, you should start with this step, with this simplified complex for the two crossings, 
and add another complex, add, sorry, add another crossing to that and simplify again. Okay, that ends that example. Um, well, and it also ends half an hour into this talk what I'd sort of had in mind to do all yesterday. Uh, and I'll, I'll finally start talking about the things we had planned to talk about today. Um, before that, let me just say one more thing about this setup and uh, the argument that we had here about um, complexes having homotopy representatives without differentials. We worked over C, and, and we, you know, I mean, or, or we worked over a field. It's interesting, and lots of people are interested in doing Kavanaugh homology over the integers or over something else. And then you see torsion with respect to the, the ring you're working over. And these lemmas all just fail, and you have to take homology. Uh, you have to apply this functor maps from the empty diagram and then take homology in order to get a useful invariant. Uh, you see torsion, and it's unclear whether the homotopy type uh, of the complex records any more information than you see in the homology there. I don't like integer torsion, so I won't say anything more than that. Okay, so the two other things that, that need to be covered uh, when talking about Kavanaugh homology are functor reality and, uh, and, and deformations of Kavanaugh homology. They're actually sort of they're pr pretty closely related topics. So if you remember going right back to the beginning of yesterday, I'd said, if anyone is following along in the lecture notes, I'm now finally in the new page that I, I had at the back of the hall today. Uh, if you remember right back at the end of yesterday, I'd said that Kavanaugh homology is a categorical not invariant. We associate objects in some category to links, and to an isotopy of links, we associate an isomorphism in that category. I haven't told you that isomorphism yet, and we better do that now. So, uh, what do we do? So, to each right to move, Uh, we write down a particular homotopy equivalence. I certainly won't do this today, but you can look it up in, in various papers. Uh, so, for example, if we look at KH of uh, this little tangle, so in the language that I've been using so far, the Kravanov invariant of this tangle is some, uh, is some element of this HOM space from three points to three points. And we have to pick a particular homotopy equivalence between that complex there and the complex that we get from looking at this tangle. And similarly for the other Radomeister moves. And in particular, we have to do this for all different orientations of the Radomeister moves. Okay, and we can do more. Uh, more, we associate chain maps to Morse moves. These are chain maps that aren't invertible, they're not equivalences. But these are actually extremely easy to define and understand. You don't, here it's complicated, you've got to go and write particular things down. But here it's sort of obvious. Let me just say what I mean by Morse moves. Well, these are cobordisms of links where you create an unknot where you kill an unknot, or you do a saddle cobordism somewhere inside your, inside your link. And I'll use this example to just show you what these chain maps are. They're nice and simple. Uh, hmm. I should have written this board somewhere else because I want to line things up with this. Let me, let me be evil and erase this right after I've written it. So say that we want to uh, say, uh, look at the cobordism from this link to another link. Say, uh, uh, the saddle move in between the two crossings. Okay, well, the the complex for this is pretty easy. Maybe I'll leave out the factors of Q to save myself a little bit of time. Oh. Sorry. 
slapý borbak. Okay. It's just following the rule again. And there's an obvious chain map from this complex to this complex. It's just the diagonal chain map. You map that object to this object by doing this same Morse move in the same place. We map each of these objects to each of these objects by doing the same Morse move in the same place and so on. Okay? The chain maps associated with Morse moves on complexes are always just diagonal. They may be map each object, each resolution to the corresponding resolution. Okay. Now, we can take an arbitrary isotopy and, uh, and write it as a, uh, as a composition of elementary moves, which are just Rademeister moves and, uh, and these Morse moves. The problem is that there's no unique way to write an isotopy uh, as a composition of Rademeister moves and Morse moves. And so if we just try and define the chain map we want by taking the composition of all the chain maps, we have to be careful. can't write an isotopy uniquely as a composition of Rademeister and Morse moves. So the, fortunately, there's a way out of this. Let me just show you an example of the sort of thing that can go wrong. Here's a little tangle. We could do the following sequence of, uh, of moves. Here's a Rademeister 2 move. There's a Rademeister 3 move. There's another Rademeister 3 move. And there's a Rademeister 2 move done in reverse. It's easy to see that. Uh, that uh, the surface you get traced out by doing these moves is just isotopic to the identity surface. Maybe at the end I should uh, really to get back to where I started, I could, I could just move that strand back down again. Uh, the surface traced out by all of this is, is isotopic to the, uh, to the identity surface. So we better hope that if we accidentally wrote down the identity as this composition, that we get the same chain map, we get the identity chain map. But it's all fixed for us, we just meant to compose all of those Rademeister moves in turn. Okay, the problem uh, is however you pick the, uh, the chain maps for Rademeister moves, uh, this composition is minus the identity. That is the chain map minus the identity. Okay, so uh, I, I think all I'm going to say is that there's a fix. It involves something called disorientations, and I won't say anything more about it. Um, just pretend for the rest of what I have to say that there isn't this problem and that we get well-defined chain maps from isotopies by chopping up the isotopies as compositions of Rademeister moves and composing the chosen chain maps. This thing used disorientations is just going back and tweaking the uh, this category C star I described. You have to decorate the surface as you look at it a little bit and add a few more relations that deal with those decorations, and then the sign problems go away. This has something to do with categorifying SU2 uh, instead, of, well, the SU2 quantum invariant of knots instead of categorifying the Kaufman bracket invariant of knots. Okay. Um, I guess I'll, oh, I won't write anything more than, than that. Okay, so let's pretend now that Kavanaugh homology, as I defined it, is an honestly functorial thing. We know that there are these sign problems, but we can make them go away. So then the final thing I want to talk about uh, is deformations of Kavanaugh homology and how we get 
the S invariant and a lower bound for the slice genus of knots out of Kavanaugh homology. So I want you to remember a long time ago when we were talking about all of these identities on, on surfaces, one thing in particular we'd said was that any time we had two dots on a surface, we set that equal to zero. Let's go and relax that condition now and see what we get. Now, there are a few different ways you can go about relaxing this condition. Oh, sorry. Uh, one way, the, uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, well, sorry. The, the, the first way to do this was to instead have uh, that any time you see two dots, this was alpha times a, a sheet without dots uh, for some non-zero complex number. Okay? But that's a bit drastic. Uh, and for one, it fits sort of badly with the, the description I gave yesterday, where remember we wanted some Euler characteristic condition on surfaces that would break here. That Euler characteristic condition counted the number of dots on surfaces. And so these, these pictures wouldn't even be in the same home space anymore. So let's do something slightly different. Let's work over C adjoin alpha instead of C. And now, let's not say that alpha is invertible. It's just a parameter out in the coefficient ring. This will have a nice advantage. Uh, I'm going to show you how to explicitly compute the S invariant of a knot without having to play with spectral sequences or anything like that. Uh, but something, notice that something goes badly wrong. Uh, it had been really important a moment ago that we're working over a field, and we're not working over a field anymore. So we have to be a little bit careful there. OK. So before. Oh, um, well, okay, so um, that, that actually, the, sorry, the question, I meant to repeat questions. The question was, is there a reason why you don't just want to take rational functions in alpha? Um, let me answer that by uh, saying something that I omitted a moment ago that will make it clearer why we, why we don't want to do something like that. I'd complained that if you set alpha to be just some non-zero rational number, that this, uh, this relation would break the homogeneity of the, uh, of the relations. These guys would have different Euler characteristic counts. So to fix that, when we work over C of alpha, uh, we have to give alpha a formal Euler characteristic of negative four. So uh, that just means if you see some multiple of a surface, and that multiple includes alphas, you, you, count, you count the surface as if it had lower Euler characteristic than it really does. Now remember that we're only ever interested in linear combinations of surfaces that are homo homogeneous with respect to Euler characteristic minus twice the number of dots, well, and with this fix as well. And what that means is that the only way that we ever see alpha is just as powers of alpha, constant powers of alpha multiplying uh, surfaces of the same Euler characteristic. So when I say working over C of alpha, you never actually see a polynomial. You only ever see monomials. Um, and given that that's all we ever see, it would maybe be strange to do anything else. I, I know that's not a good answer. Uh, you'll, you'll see how alpha shows up in examples. Maybe. Maybe not, actually. <laughs> uh, OK, so before uh, every complex in this home space where all our link invariants live, decomposed, sorry, uh, yeah, I want to say decomposed as a direct sum of, uh, 
of copies of Q to the S times the empty diagonal. So here, in any homological height. So here I'm, I'm, I'm making the strong statement that every complex has a representative with no differentials. That is, it's just a think of this guy in some homological height as a complex all by itself, concentrated in one height with no differentials. And every complex is just a sum of those. That, of course, stops being true. But we get something almost as good and kind of interesting. What we get is that every complex in the home space from one point to one point decomposes as a direct sum of complexes. So we'll give these guys names. Uh, e, that's just a single step complex. The object is just a single strand that's, that's in this home space. No differentials. But you can put this in any Q grading. You can multiply it by Q to the S for any S. And you can put it in any homological height. And the other complexes you get are C sub N, which look like this. So this is a two-step complex. The objects are both, well, it's a strand, and q to the 2n terms a strand. And the differential is just uh, n dots on a sheet. Okay. Uh, back when two dots were 0, um, c2 would have just been two copies of e in different homological heights. But now it's, it's some indecomposable complex. OK. Uh, I'm not actually going to prove this, but the proof <coughs> is simple, especially if you love algebra. And you can do it very explicitly by looking at that lemma that I had before, that homotopy equivalence that's stripped off a direct sum end, and just think about what you can do if, instead of seeing an isomorphism somewhere, you're working over C adjoin alpha, and you see alpha to the k times an isomorphism somewhere, and higher powers of alpha multiplying everything else. And if you think through applying that lemma in that situation, you get this result here. OK. So let's just have a, an example, which is also an excellent exercise, which is that if we take the, uh, the Kavanov homology of the cut open trefoil, so because this theorem only applies to complexes in the, in the one goes to one space, we're now going to think about invariants of, of knots by cutting them open at a point, turning them into one one tangles, and sticking them into this home space. The Kavanov homology here just looks like q squared times a strand. Uh, then there's no object in this homology. Oh, and that's in homological height zero. No object here. Then q to the six times a strand here. A sheet with a dot on it. And q to the eight times a strand here. If you. Uh, if you did the, if you've already done the exercise that I suggested before of computing the Kavanov homology of the trefoil, you would have got to this answer as an intermediate step in, in that calculation. And let's just write this a little bit more succinctly. This is q squared times e direct sum uh, q to the 6 times t squared c1. So that's just saying a copy of E, but shifted up by Q squared. And it's sitting in homological height 0. That was the underline. So there's no factor of T here. And then there's a copy of C1. But it's shifted up in homological height by 2, hence the T squared. And there's an overall factor of Q to the 6. OK. Uh, something, something worth pointing out is that uh, the the coefficients that appear here, sort of the coefficient, a polynomial in Q and T that appears in front of E, and the coefficients that appear in front of each CN are each individually invariants of, of the knot. Uh, if you know and love the spectral sequence description of, of Lie homology and Kavanov homology, these, uh, in, these invariants, the coefficients in front of each of the C to the Ns, are capturing all of the information in that spectral sequence. OK. Um, 
What do I want to say about that? Well, the first thing is uh, a theorem of Lee's, which in this language says that if you have a link with k components, there are 2 to the k minus 1 copies of E. There's actually a very nice diagrammatic proof of this theorem. Uh, but I guess I, I won't do it today. So you can check for the trefoil. We had one copy of E. And if you went back to the calculation that I, I guess that I showed on the overhead, there were two copies of E in the invariant of the Hopflink. And in fact, that was all in the Hopflink. It was just two copies of E. OK. So then here's a definition. The S invariant of a knot. is the power of Q appearing with the unique copy of E. And said this way, this is a great definition because we've seen that the S invariant is explicitly computable. You take your complex for the cut open knot and you just apply that, that homotopy lemma, the stripping off a, 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 um, a sum and over and over again, and you know that you have to get into this form, and you'll, you'll see the, the, the power of Q that appears in front of, in front of the, the one copy of, of E. Um, before, if you don't think of, of the S invariant in this way, then the definition of the S invariant is a little bit complicated. Uh, you know that you have this crazy spectral sequence, and you know that not much survives on the final page. And you have to look at the, the pre-image of the things on the final page and find the maximum height that any pre-image sits in. And it's a, I think this is, this is a, a more computable way to get at the S invariant. Um, and there are programs. Part of the knot theory package has a, has a program that, that uses exactly this method to give you the S invariant of a knot. OK. So then the theorem. Uh, yeah, okay. The theorem of Rasmussen is just that the absolute value of the S invariant divided by 2 gives a lower bound for the slice genus of the knot. So this is just look at uh, all surfaces uh, in B4 meeting your knot in the boundary S3 and uh, just take the minimum genus over those surfaces. OK. Now, I guess in the five minutes remaining, I can actually just prove this theorem. Because in this setup, well, OK, prove it with, with, with one gap. But it, it's conceptually very, very easy in this setup. Let's just look in the example of the trefoil, and we'll see what's going on. Actually, no, well, no, no. Let's, let's not look at the example of the trefoil. Let's just take any knot. So here we've got kh of a knot. So in this last part of the talk, I'm only talking about knots, not links, because I need there to be a unique copy of, of E. And I see that it's got q to the s times e, direct sum, a whole lot of other stuff, all of the, the CNs. And I think about uh, a surface. Well, sorry, I, I should write uh, k cut here, OK? So now let's. Think about some surface which bounds the knot sitting in the four ball. And let's first of all delete a disk from somewhere inside. So it's now a cobordism from the unknot to, to our particular knot. And now let's cut open the whole cobordism by picking some interval on the, on the surface, joining the top knot and the bottom knot, and slice it open. So that then is some cobordism from a single strand up to the cut open knot. OK? So between these Kavanov homologies, we get, via functoriality, a chain map uh, determined by the, the surface that we're looking at. Well, what's down here? It's easy to check that 
the invariant of a single strand is just q to the 0 times e. The S invariant is 0 here. So the, the step that I'm not going to prove standing at the board, but is again, uh, it again admits a, a really easy diagrammatic proof. Well, actually, sorry, not quite as easy. Um, <laughs> this theorem of Lee's has a very easy diagrammatic proof. This lemma here, if you want to see the proof, then you actually do have to look at the definition of the chain maps that we use for the Reitermeister moves, and you need to check something about each of those chain maps. Okay, so the lemma is just that uh, a connected cobordism from the strand to a cut open knot is non zero between the two copies of E. Okay, and this is, I mean, once you go look at those chain maps, this is just saying, well, sort of, uh, well, you, you, yeah, I, I guess I won't, I, I won't try and explain that. Okay, so well, what's that? Well, we've got some non-zero map here. What can that map be? Well, we know that, we know what the homes are from a single strand to a single strand. They're all just some sheet with some number of dots on it, okay? But we also know that there's this grading condition, this Euler characteristic condition on Holmes. And so maybe I should just try and recall that. Uh, to, to, be in a, to be in a home from Q to the KD to Q to the K prime D prime, the condition is that you need to have your Euler characteristic equals uh, k minus k prime plus twice the number of dots plus half n plus m. We're here, d and d prime are both diagrams with endpoints at the bottom and endpoints at the top. So let's just look at that formula here. Well, the Euler characteristic of this surface is just one, it's a disk. Uh, k is zero, because we're starting at q to the zero here. k prime, is S plus 2N uh, plus 1, okay? Uh, sorry. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that one there was me being very hasty. <laughs> that Euler characteristic there is the Euler characteristic of the surface, of the cobordism that we're looking at from the, the strand to the, the cut open knot. So I better leave the Euler characteristic there. Okay, now let's just rearrange a little bit and write this, well, okay. Let's just observe that the number of dots must be positive, okay? We can't, don't have negative numbers of dots. So this quantity is positive, and so we can write that uh, rearranging a little, that the Euler characteristic minus one uh, is greater than negative s, or the Euler characteristic over two is greater than negative s, okay? This number here, if you think about what we've done to our surface in the four ball, this number here is exactly the genus of that surface, okay? And we've seen that the genus is at least negative the s invariant. Uh, sorry, um, I got my factors of two wrong somewhere. I didn't divide by two over here, very good. <laughs> okay, it's at least negative s over two. Uh, now, why the minus sign in the theorem, but the negative sign here? We can just look at the mirror image of everything. When you take the mirror image of everything, all of the powers of Q get negated, and you get the same inequality the other way around. That gives us the, uh, that gives us the theorem. Okay. Um, I think I've got either one minute or less than one minute, either plus one minute or, or minus one minute. So let me just um, say one thing about this... Uh, uh, this theorem over here that every complex admits a decomposition like that, well, that gives you a, uh, um, a bunch of nice invariants that tell you all about the spectral sequence for Kavano homology. Um, and uh, a conjecture, and I, I, the only reason I'm going slightly over time to write this up 
is that Peter Horn told me something out in the hall just this morning that seems to indicate that maybe this conjecture is false. Uh, and so I'm very excited to hear the details. The conjecture is that you don't see high CNs, you only see C1 and C2. And the, the neat little corollary of this conjecture is that the S invariant of a knot, you can just read off right from the two variable polynomial. Remember that this is a, very, a polynomial in Q and T, so you just leave Q there. Um, well, maybe I'll write, I'll write Q to the SK on the left hand side. Uh, and I substitute it in T equals negative Q to the negative 4, and I divide the whole thing by Q plus Q inverse. If this conjecture is true, then this is a really easy corollary that you can read off the S invariant from the two variable polynomial. Now, of course, perhaps the conjecture is false. Um, maybe Peter's seen evidence that it, that it is false, and I don't think anyone has any idea how you might prove it. Um, it turns out that knowing this decomposition, you can think about what it means for the two variable polynomial, and you can discover that the two variable polynomial constrains the possible decompositions into E's and CN's. And even though there might be multiple different decompositions which are compatible with the two variable polynomial, in practice, often, they all share the same value of S, that is, where the copy of E sits. And so, in a great many cases, you can read the S invariant directly from the two variable polynomial, but perhaps not always. Um, yeah, I'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs>